morning. My name is Katherine Wendelsdorf. I'm a senior scientist for applications at Kaijin Informatics. Just very briefly, what we do as a company is that we create tools to generate as well as make sense of big biological data sets, so proteomics, transcriptomics, uh, genomics data sets. We also make software tools that then leverage information about any particular variants, genes, or proteins that you identify as differentially regulating your system. Uh, we gather information that's known about each of those to then identify, well, what are the molecular to molecular interactions that are likely occurring in your system, or what are the genetic variants that are most likely leading to the phenotype that you're seeing. So that's what we do at Kyogen Informatics. We make tools to do that. Uh, but here in this panel today, we're addressing the question of how can non-professionals, so how can patients, non-scientists, be a driving force behind medical breakthroughs of the future. And as we've just talked about, we could all stay in unison right now by sharing their health and genomic data. And so we as panelists today are addressing, well, how are we specifically helping patients share their health and genetic data, but in a useful way, in a useful context, so that scientists can actually take that donated data uh, and use it to, do I have a clicker? This is a good enough clicker, right? Oh, no, guess not. Okay. And use it to drive research, so to actually go from these omics data sets to deriving a mechanism to then translating them into actionable prognostics, diagnostics, and treatment quicker. So to explain how we are doing that at Kaijin Informatics, let me first talk about a key challenge in personalized medicine. Okay. So one of the things we want to do in personalized medicine is we want to identify genetic variants that are the cause for some particular disease, for example. And often a way of doing that is that we'll take genomes from patients who have the disease, and we'll take genomes from healthy people who don't have the disease, and we'll simply compare the two groups, right? And we'll see, well, hey, what are some genetic variants that the patients have that those healthy controls don't have? Well, I'm sure you are well aware that that can be kind of a headache because anytime you compare a set of genomes, it's gonna be riddled with differences. And so you're gonna to have to go through each of these differences, each of these variants and say, well, it's probably not this C to G here because there's a G in one of my case controls, or one of my controls. Or it's probably not this C, this T to C over here because I happen to know that that C occurs very commonly in the general population. Or it's probably not this T to C here because I happen to know that that's a synonymous mutation. It's not gonna be functionally relevant. So essentially what the challenge is, is that you have to bring in all this other information, often in disparate places, into one place to be able to go through and systematically filter down a set of variants to identify the variant that is the most likely causal variant for the disease of interest. So one tool that we have that researchers use to overcome this challenge is the ingenuity variant analysis. So this is a tool where researchers will read in, excuse me, is, is there a pointer that I can use that I was told that there was? Thank you. That's the, that's the pointer, that's your return. How come I won't, oh, great. And the clicker to the right, left. Okay, great. Thank you everyone for your patience in that. So ingenuity variant analysis is a tool where one reads in their large set of candidate variants, these could be hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands to millions, and then brings in information from many different areas to construct a customizable filter cascade that allows them to whittle that list of variants down to the most likely causal variant for the disease of interest, and then actually leverage information that's known about the mutated gene already to quickly derive hypothetical pathways by which that mutated gene could be linked to the phenotype. And then within the tool, there's many options to then share your analysis or your samples with your colleagues for follow-up. Great. 
So ingenuity variant analysis brings in content from a variety of different sequence banks as well as experimental databases and also includes millions of peer-reviewed literature findings from that are carried by MD PhD level scientists which is our knowledge base. And the idea is that in variant analysis you can bring all that information into one tool in simple user interface to then construct a filter cascade that looks like this where one can read in a set of, in this case, 46,000 candidate variants, and then sequentially whittle that list down based on how good the data is, but also based on how common that variant is in a set of sequence banks that represent the general population, whether that variant fits some particular uh, criteria for likely being functionally relevant, so Maybe it's been shown to be pathogenic in the literature, or maybe it shares some characteristic of a mutation that's known to be pathogenic, or maybe it occurs in a region that's known to be functionally relevant. The user can set whatever uh, criteria that they want, or you, and then you can say whether the variant uh, actually follows a pattern that you would expect it to follow if it were the disease-causing variant, such as being seen exclusively in your case samples, but in none of your control samples. Or whether the variant is known to occur in a gene that's already known to affect a particular disease or process of interest. And so researchers use this tool to make those settings in their filter cascade, and then they can whittle that list down to the variant that makes it through the filter cascade, so those that fit all that criteria, and that would be, in this case, these five variants over two genes, at which point you can then leverage the information from our knowledge base about the mutated gene to see, well, what are some particular pathways in the system that would be affected, okay? So that's variant analysis, and that is a tool that is very effective at overcoming this challenge of bringing in external information to filter your variants to the most likely causal variant. But our users and the research community as a whole Though they have tools to meet their filter challenge, we still have a data challenge, right? So someone can come to variant analysis, and they may have their, their case samples, their control samples, and they use the tool to quickly, effectively find a mutation X that occurs in all their case samples and none of their control samples. So they may conclude, okay, well, mutation X is what's causing my disease, right? But now let's say down the line, they get their hands on a few more healthy genomes, and all of a sudden they see, oh, well, there actually are some healthy people out there who have this mutation X. Well, that effectively negates that, that hypothesis, or at least causes a researcher to change it drastically. So the problem that we're running into is that a variant that is rare in one healthy subpopulation may be common in another healthy subpopulation and much more data is needed to actually filter out these irrelevant data, data that is scarce right now. So researchers need more well-phenotyped genomes. And that's where the Empowered Genome Community comes in. So this is a program that we've launched, and what it aims to do is to help individuals make their own well-sequenced genomes more scientifically useful. By, explore, by being able to explore it with invariant analysis as well as share it with researchers. So in short, what we're doing as a company is that if an individual, any individual, has their genome sequenced, maybe with the Personal Genome Project or with Illumina's Understand Your Genome Program or any, any way they have their genome sequenced or partially sequenced or even genotyped, let's say with 23andMe, they can upload their own variants into variant analysis and use the tool for free to analyze their own sequence. And then within the tool, they then have the option to share it with any researchers who are using our tool. And they, those samples can either serve as cases or as controls. So the benefit for the sequence C is that they get access to a user-friendly interface that allows them to use this filter cascade to actually understand and explore their own data, to demystify it a bit, as well as be able to get access to the primary research and literature findings about their own genes, their own variants. 
Users may also submit their variants once they're in variant analysis to the allele frequency community. So this is another program that's hosted by variant analysis. And this is a community of researchers and laboratories that have pulled together their samples to create a database of allele frequency statistics across those samples. So this includes exome and genome sequence samples from a variety of large laboratories, just a few are listed here. And it actually makes it the largest integrated, freely accessible, and hosted community database of allele frequencies available to date. So they can actually help us build out that database. And then lastly, and most importantly, as a scientist, uh, these sequences, so scientists or non-scientists, whoever it is, can actually share their genetic sample and their health data. Now they have two options here. They can either share it broadly, in which case they fill out a health survey and they agree to make that health information linked with their genetic sequence available to all variant analysis users, or they can share it privately within the tool, so only sharing a subset of their genetic data or a subset of their health information with a specific researcher who contacts them or who they contact. In terms of the researchers who use our tool, they benefit because they get access to any of those broadly shared genomes and can actually specify the phenotype they need. So we have researchers who contact us and say, you know what, I need a few more controls for my study. So do you have any genomes right now with, for women over the age of 50 years old but with no history of breast cancer? Or do you have additional cases I can use? So do you have genomes from women under the age of 40 with a history of breast cancer? And so if we do have the number of genomes that they need and the phenotypes they need, then they magically just show up in the user's um, account, at which point they can then use them in their case control studies. Okay. Also, researchers can filter their variants against the allele frequency community, um, of which empowered genome community variants are added to. And then they can also get in contact with individuals who have a specific variant or variant set of interest. So in this case, we implement actually a match.com model. That's, that is who we looked at. Um, I'm sure all of you know match.com works. If you don't, you're lying. Uh, so the way that match.com works and the way that our pinging works is that let's say I'm a researcher and I find this variant through my variant analysis filter cascade, and I'm really interested in it, and I want more samples with that variant in it. Well, what I can do is I can send out that variant as a search term within variant analysis, and I will get back a message that says, we have found 10 samples, 10 of searchable samples, uh, that have that variant. Would you like to contact the owners of that sample, of those 10 samples? And then the owners of those 10 samples will get an email saying there is a researcher who would like to contact you because they found, because there's a variant in your sample that they want to analyze. Do you agree to be contacted? If the owner agrees to be contacted, then the researcher who did the query in the first place gets their contact information, and now really the collaboration is up to them. But they can share their samples or a variety of their samples or come up with whatever agreement they want within the tool. So that is one of the ways that we are helping people to make their data useful is with this Empowered Genome Community, and the goal really is to give sequences access to the secure platform for exploring their own genomes, either on their own or jointly with researchers to really foster these citizen-scientist collaborations. And the security of our platform lets sequences own and control their own data, while at the same time making it scientifically useful. And then, even more importantly, it does give researchers much needed access to additional information. So this is just one way that we saw that we could use our tool to help drive this process whereby the patient can give data to the scientist and the scientist in return can make more discoveries and treatments that go back to the patient. Mm -hmm.